Today, we're in Brisbane, and I'm about to conduct a fireside chat with Pup Scout. But I offer a sincere thanks to Sir Twitch for the use of his comfortable home in Brisbane. And Pup Scout, welcome to the fireside chats. Good afternoon, Gump. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. So tell us, starting right at the beginning, where are you from? Tell us a bit about your family. Where was I was born. I was born in Sydney. Okay. Uh, in Auburn, Sydney, near Parramatta. And I grew up, um, and wasn't long before I moved to the city itself when I was old enough. And I had two brothers and a sister. Okay. What did your family do? Not very much. Ah. Um, my sister's a psychologist now, my brother lives in the States, okay. and my other brother um, does IT stuff. Okay. What was, did your family work professionally, or what work did your parents do? My mother stayed at home. She was a housewife. Okay. Um, you know, the whole nuclear family thing. And my father um, was a tailor by trade, and basically was the breadwinner of the family. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your schooling, because you told me that you were bullied at school. It was, it was not a good time for you. Schooling was certainly a challenge. Um, bullying, you know, was something there. I, I had um, a speech impediment and uh, hearing aids, which I still wear today. Um, and because you're different, um, bullying was certainly uh, something that uh, was uncontrollable. Um, and, you know, kids were just nasty. Until about year eight. For example, what did they do? Uh, they got the hearing aids off. Um, there was sometimes violence, name falling, pushing, shoving. Um, I was also quite small, so there were bigger kids would pick up the smaller kids. Um, so yeah, it was quite a uh, traumatic experience going to school. Did the school administration do anything about this? The school administration did what they could do. Uh, I believe the bullying policies uh, certainly were, are, are normally a lot better now. Um, however, the, the rates of suicide certainly are still quite high. Um, I was part of the um, school watch report that was done in 1998 uh, in New South Wales schools, uh, looking at GLBTI um, students who were bullied, harassed, and um, the response. Those were openly out. Certainly, there was very little support within the school system. Um, I wasn't out at school. Um, I got bullied because of my hearing, mainly. But you said it changed in, what, the eighth year? Um, so, high school, year eight. So, a um, bit different to probably what other school systems are. Um, I certainly decided to stand up for myself and um, miraculously connected with someone in a, um, in a manner that wasn't what I did and um, bullying came to an end for me. What do you mean connected with someone? I hit him. Okay. So yeah, he pushed me, pushed me too far and I decided to throw a punch. And um, yes, he fell over in the back of the chair and next thing the bullies stopped. Oh, you... Not the best way to do things, but... You basically took back your power then? Yes. Okay. Okay, so you said that your interest in boys was organic. What what does that mean? Um, it. I knew from a very early age that I was different. That I didn't see girls like others would see girls. I saw boys as um, different. Um, you know, people would say, "Oh, that's you know, growing up, and that's." you know, just what boys do. But as that continued into teenage years, um, it certainly got a lot more than just um, fiddling. It got a lot more to more of sexual nature. Um, and certainly, you know, a lot of friends would talk about women in a certain way, and I'm like, well, I don't feel that. And you learn to survive, because you don't want to be out, because there was a lot of homophobia. So you learn to survive by going, oh yeah, you know, I did that too. And you learn how they carry on and mock their behaviour when you know you're looking at them in the change room rather than looking, you know, what they're going on with. 
Um, so from a very from a early teen years, I I knew I was certainly gay. What was your attraction? What about them attracted you? Um, the, like their muscles, the muscles. I mean, women just didn't do anything for me. Um, guys did. It was just it was you know I looked at a woman. Yeah, that's a nice nice girl. <laughs> that was it. You look at a guy, yeah, he's hot. So there was a, the chemical, I guess, in the brain were wired to go, hey, this person is hot, he's a guy, and I want to do stuff with this person. And from a female perspective, I didn't get that at all. Did you act on any of this interest? Yes. What did you do in high school? Um, all sorts of things. I learned, you know, how to suck dick. <laughs> um, um, I was certainly probably not at the age of consent when I was doing things. Um, back in that day, we didn't have Grindr. We right. didn't have Recon. We didn't have apps. Right. Um, I was, I left school and did my apprenticeship in, after year 11. And I got paid. So apprenticeship got paid. And it was not very much money. But it afforded $49 to go down to a Westpac bank and deposit money into a branch to use a telephone line that you go into the old pay phone and because they got rid of the old dial-up rotary phones and you dial in and you leave a message for someone and you had to go back and dial in later on. Now, if you didn't have a membership that was $49, you had to ring a, ring a 1-900 number which was a lot more expensive. However, I didn't want that number on my parents' phone bill. So they wouldn't know because the Sydney number an O2 number did not show up on the bill. So I was able to hide the fact that I was meeting people under that, say, the Glacial Bridge in Sydney. At what age were you doing this? Maybe 15 and a half. My gosh, okay. 16. And did these, did these other people have any concerns about someone so young when they would finally meet you? I was very mature. Oh, all right. Um, there were questions sometimes, and I was like, oh yeah, I may need. Um, I may have, you know, acquired a, a card from a video store that says I was 18, because only 18 year olds would have a membership to a, um, a video shop, oh, okay. uh, to, to hire VHS videos. So I said, oh, I may need, here's my card, I've got a, a video easy card. So it, it, even back then, allowed me into bars. And I found the Barracks Bar in Sydney. My gosh. But you said, when we, when we were preparing for this interview, you said that there was something called the Grim Reaper television ad that aired on Australian television, but you misunderstood it. So tell us about that. What was it? Um, so the response, I was very young, so about five or six, and um, I were hearing aids. Mm. Um, back then I had hearing aids. And so your understanding on what AIDS were, because they weren't referred to as hearing aids, they were referred to as AIDS. You know, have you got your AIDS on? Mm. Suddenly this ad um, with the Grim Reaper, which was bowling uh, at people who were the pins and knocking these people over, children, women, men, everyone. And it was quite a dark, I mean, it gave me nightmares, ad that... Um, made me feel that if I wore my age, my, age, my hearing aids, I was going to die. So suddenly they were pulled out of my ears. Because I didn't have that understanding of what, the concept of what that ad was trying to sell. Uh, what uh -huh. the ad was, was a government attempt to raise awareness about the um, HIV AIDS epidemic that was occurring. Which, without knowing at that age obviously, but knowing the history of it now, uh, created more stigma within our own, with, with, within the communities against the GLBTIQ communities, especially those who are gay, gay men. Because uh, a lot of people targeted gay men for, for the HIV AIDS epidemic that occurred in that era, and that was around ni in the 90s. So you're saying that the television ad actually backfired on the LGBT community, is that right? I believe so, yes. Okay. I firmly believe that that ad caused more stimulants, um, cause more people to um, categorise people in a certain uh, stereotype and cause 
severe stigma. Uh, also, it, those who who did get HIV, who saw the ad, it was a death sentence. The ad delivered a death sentence and that was your only hope. You didn't have any other hope. And so I believe it certainly um, affected a lot of people's mental health as well um, with that advert. Did eventually other adverts come up that were better, that, that did a better job here? Or? Not to that degree. I mean, I think that ad certainly did, um, it did bring awareness to, to what was going on in a, a fashion that I, I don't know if that was the intention, but certainly it brought that, you know, I think the government of the day would certainly say it was to be proactive um, because they weren't understanding what was going on. However, in 90, by 1997, when I was 17, 18, um, ACON, which was previously a AIDS Council of New South Wales, certainly was a lot more proactive with their adverts and there was a lot more about condom use, um, there was a lot more, you know, testing, and there was a lot more education out there for that, um, so this is obviously before PrEP, mm -hmm. so pre-PrEP days, um, it was a lot more, the adver advertising targeted was a lot more to remove the stereotype and to also remove the fact that it was no longer a death sentence. Mm -hmm. At the same time, governments have put money into research for drugs that were available on the PBS as well for people to be able to um, manage their HIV. I'm sorry, PBS? Pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme. Ah, okay. Yes, okay. the PBS, oh, Pharmaceutical okay. Benefit Scheme. That's uh, a scheme within, the, within Australia. Oh, okay. Where people who are on Low income of healthcare cards can get their medicines. Uh, currently $6.20, it was probably less than, uh, rather than you know, 30 40 or $50 or more. Got it, okay. But taking one step back, you, you said a few moments ago that that little card from the video shop got you into the bars when you were very young. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, I also found Headquarters, down in Sydney, okay. uh, which was a SOPV. I'm sorry, SIVP? SOPV, Sets on Premises Venue. Got it, okay. Um, so I found Oxford Street because, you know, it was always a joke, it was a pink triangle, and um, I wanted to find this pink triangle. Anyway, I, I, we found it. We stumbled upon the pink triangle, which was Oxford Street, um, where they had the old Aubrey Bar, Flinders uh, Street Hotel, and the Barracks, and, and, and a few others. I mean, the Oxford is still there, um, the Stonewall is still there, um, but others are no longer there. Um, so I found the Aubrey first, and that was amazing. And then you followed the crowd, and I found the Midnight Shift, I found... Um, the Flinders Hotel, and a lot of the times I just walked in and never asked for ID. Okay. I mean, these days I, they're a lot more stringent with you know asking for ID. Mm -hmm. um, but I did look older than what I was, so I was able to pull that off. Because other people who were with me, who were sometimes a little bit older or younger, were asked for ID, and I just walked through like I oh, I don't need ID. And when they asked for ID, they accepted a video easy card. Not a photo ID. Fascinating. Mm. So, because it had my date of birth on it, which the Video Easy guy who I knew uh, spunked my date of birth on the Video Easy card so I didn't have one. So it said I was older than what I really was. And the Barracks Bar, which was the leather bar, and that's kind of where I met my first sir, was in the Barracks. Uh, it was more headquarters, but we went to the barracks several times. Um, on my 18th birthday, I walked up to the security guards and it's my birthday. So, oh, how are you? must be 21. And I laughed at him. I went, no, I was 18. And he wasn't very impressed. Tell us about the bars, though, at that time. What sorts of venues were they? The Aubrey was uh, a very dance venue. Um, very busy. Uh, the bars were probably a lot busier than what they are now, um, back then. Um, there was a vibe about them. There was okay. this really good vibe and it was 
this is our familiar bars. Um, obviously, different tastes went to different bars, and different people went to different bars. Uh, certainly, if you're in the Flinders Street bar, you knew at 3 a.m. in the morning you were there with the same crowd that were going to be there every other weekend for the <laughs> next 10 years. Uh, so that bar was the last to close. Okay. Uh, the barracks was the leather bar. And what we got away with, or what we possibly couldn't have done, but we did in the barracks or other bars, you certainly couldn't do today. Such as? A lot more nudity. Um, in the bars, there was a lot more sexual activity. There was a lot of blind eyes being turned to what was going on in those bars, um, in the way that, you know, instead of going to the toilets to suck dick, you may go right in front of the bartender. Now, you try to do that in a bar in Australia today, even if it's a gay bar, you'd be thrown out because of the, um, the laws. So, uh, the barracks, for example, had a, um, a spider web chain that regularly uh, guys were ch chained to and things were done to. So, quite open, anyone could have seen it, anyone could have walked in and participated. When was this? How, how long ago was this? 1996 okay. to the um, early 2000s. Okay. okay. Um, it's definitely changed around the Olympics. The 2000s Olympics. It really changed. Why do you think, why, why then? Did they just go on a big clean-up campaign? Or? There were more laws introduced in New South Wales to meet the requirements of the Sydney Olympics. Um, there was also um, more alcohol laws being brought in. Um, there were more violence incidents occurring on the streets. Um, hmm. Officer Street if was not immune to violent incidents. Um, I also believe that um, <coughs> the, the drug scene got, you know, like meth became more then rather than just speed or, or the, the stuff that that was low, a lot that not used now as much, or ecstasy, uh, things were a lot stronger then, and, and they still continue to get stronger. And I feel that um, the lockout laws that came much later, but I think that led up to the lockout laws that occurred in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, uh, which killed a lot of the nightlife in Australia. And for the benefit of an international audience, the lockout laws were basically at what time the bar was going to close and turn everyone out, right? Yes. Okay. So, where bars used to go to five, six, seven, eight, and there wasn't really many restrictions by my understanding because they were all open quite late in the, in the night spots. Um, everyone now thrown out at, depending where you are, from 1am to 2am. Okay. And they haven't gone and fixed, well, hold on, we've got all these people out of the bars who are now drunk, um, who are now going to get home. So they consequently caused another problem and they've also cut the revenue of um, bars which are now seen a lot of them close. Yeah. Um, the lockout laws, which were much later, but to the lead of that, you know, you had Olga, which is the Office of Gaming Liquor Reformed, uh, Accords were formed and they brought in various policies um, and licence restrictions that was to curb behaviours. Um, and also, society changed. Society um, uh, kind of changed from how they were doing, what they were doing. Um, Oxford Street was no longer just gay. Oxford Street was becoming more pansexual. Mm. Um, the nightclubs were allowing more, a lot more straight people in, so a lot of gay people were moving out of Oxford Street and more toward Newtown. So the culture was even changing. Mm. Um, and I feel that kind of was a big part of what was going on. Um, and a lot of people would, would comment that, you know, it wasn't what it was. Yeah. And I have to agree with that. It wasn't what it was. Um, when I first went on off the streets, you had drag queens in makeup, full dress, in the middle of the day, you know, carrying on, to now you walk up off the street and it's quite tame. Yeah, yeah. To what it was. But back in the day you were a dancing boy. Tell us about that. Back in the day. So there was the Probe Adult Bookshop that was in uh, Oxford Street down in um, the centre of it all and they had Dancing Boys mm -hmm. and um, that's one of the activities that I did for extra money. 
um, because they would, you get paid to do the dance in the studio thing they had set up upstairs on level three. And there were these little glory hole windows that uh, people put cash in to touch. <laughs> and if they put enough cash in, you might have given them the key and they came in the room with you. Okay, how much was that? How much would they have to pay? hundred dollars. Oh, okay. Two okay. fifties or a hundred. Uh, certainly when the international visitors were in, um, the Americans and the Canadians were a lot more generous with um, throwing large sums of money. You know, I, I know there were times when uh, American tourists were throwing 500 bucks. Wow. And wow. you might even go out for dinner and go home with them mm -hmm. and spend the night. Wow. So yeah, it was a whole lot of fun. I was 18, 19 at the time. What was your reason for doing that? It was fun. Oh, okay. At first it was, oh, fun, <laughs> extra money. Um, when you're on the apprentice wage at the time, it's only two hundred twenty dollars a week. Mm. You you get, so it was certainly extra income. Okay. How much of that were you able to keep? What percentage belonged to you? All of it. Oh really? Oh okay. Yeah, okay. all of it. It wasn't like um, when you worked, say, for um, the the like night call or somewhere like that, which is like um, a call boy house. Mm -hmm. Um. You got seventy percent. Okay. okay. So it was two hundred dollars. You got seventy percent of that two hundred dollars. Yes. Uh, if the client wanted two boys, uh, then it was sixty-five percentage okay. of the total amount um, to what and the and the house kept mm -hmm. the Fair rest. Yeah. Um, if there was out calls, uh, you were taken in a BMW, dropped off um, with a, a driver and a security guard and they would come back and grab you, pick you up. Uh, the person had paid the credit card, if they were extending the visit, you'd have to ring, and they'd make the charge over the phone, and you'd stay longer. Um, you got your normal rate, and they got the, um, the call-out fee, I guess, the, the out-call. Oh, okay. So just say the normal rate was 150, it might be 200 for an out-call, so you only got your normal rate of the 150, you didn't get any of the the um, outpour rate, hmm. but okay. they provided security and a vehicle and made sure you were safe. Oh, okay, okay. But you said you, you stumbled upon the barracks bar though, How? what happened with that? So the barracks bar was in a laneway. She had Taylor, Taylor Square, so when you see Mardi Gras go around the, the tournament strip where all the cameras are, that's Taylor Square. So that, that intersection okay. is there, and that Taylor Square is right there. Okay. And you had a, a hotel there, and that was a very, I guess, what we call the credit card queens that were going to put on the credit cards, and they would go there anyway. There was a little laneway that was behind that building, that, and that went downstairs into the barracks bar. Okay. So it was... One night walking to go and get, um, there was a little kebab shop thing that was on the corner that you could get something to eat and when you've been drinking and stuff, I remember walking around and here was this security guard just standing there. I'm like, why is he there? So I walked up and it was a bar and okay. it, there were people walking in there in leather <clears throat> and I was like, can I go down? And he looked at me and said, Are you 18? Yes. And I think it was also like answered so confidently that it wasn't ever asked. Like, are you sure? Like, yes, no, I'm 18. Um, okay. And this gentleman was in full leather who was standing over by the side. I didn't really pay any attention because I was just, wow, look at this place, this is amazing. Um, had a few drinks and went home. I went there and decided to go there the following weekend and go there earlier and there was this same gentleman in full leather standing in the bar and he brought me a drink and uh, that was very appreciative, um, which was really nice. I then decided to go to headquarters which was the leather set on premises venue but there was also body line which was the spa bar my house and there was a few others. Um, 
And I was watching in the pool lounge and this leather figure from the Barrett's bar walked in. Oh, okay. And I'm sitting there and suddenly I got all scared. I'm like, what do I do now? Because you've blocked the entrance, there's no way in, no way out. And I'm like, I'll just pretend he's not there and just... And he put his leg up, put his boot on the stool next to me. Do you want to lick my boots? What? <laughs> so I did. Okay. And then I licked his leather. And then we fucked. And then I had a surf. Okay. And that's how I found the barracks and the head and headquarters. Did he act as a mentor toward you then in the community? Definitely. Yes. How did, how did that mentorship benefit you? In many ways. Um, it brought me into the leather community. Okay. Um, I got my first pair of leather pants. Um, which I had to be suspended at Mephisto Leather to be able to get them for nothing. <laughs> Whilst the shop was open. Okay. Um, he was probably someone who was in the community quite known, who knew people, because I remember going to City Leather Pride meetings and everyone knew who he was. Okay. Um, I didn't quite understand that because politics of the community never came home. I was sheltered oh. from these politics. So I didn't really know. It wasn't until we went to a few of the meetings where he brought me along that I realised the extent that, that, that he was involved in the politics. And it was quite interesting that a lot of the times the younger guys, uh, and whether it was Mardi Gras with guys and girls and trans, but it was a lot of guys, it was a lot of the younger guys, were taken to a separate room where we would come up with projects and I keep us entertained while the adults did the talking, I, mm. I, I guess. Okay. And our voices weren't really... We were kind of protected from this political... What was ever, whatever was happening. And I believe um, there were things that were, were happening I don't quite know. Huh. Okay. Um, because it wasn't something that was never discussed. We went home and what, what happened? Nothing. Nothing, boy, nothing happened. Why was this being kept from you, do you think? I think the DS that we had, because there was a contract, there was agreements that we went through, and I was also, he knew I was not 18. Okay. Also. He knew I was, and that, at that time I was about 17. So he knew I wasn't 18. And back then in New South Wales, the age of consent was 18. Okay. Legally now 16. Oh, okay. Um, but back then it, it was, you know, I wasn't quite 18, so... And he knew I was, you know, as he said, I can't stop you from going to the bars. They know, they, they think you're 18. I, you know, I can, you know, that's your learning, that's your journey. Um, I can't stop you doing that. Um, he ascertained quite early that I knew exactly what I wanted and I was, I, I was going to get what I wanted. So if I was going to go on subject, I was going to subject. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If I was going to go and bend over with someone, you know, it was going to be a thing. So he couldn't really say no. So he certainly, while he did at times, did mention that he felt that, you know, lying about an age is not always a good thing. Mm -hmm. So so we knew, he knew, like he taught, taught values of what he felt the values of the community were. I was a lot shy. I mean, most people would probably not believe that I was shy. Most people now know me as very outspoken, um, and certainly I speak my mind. I'm not afraid to do that. Um, now, back then I didn't. I was a lot more shy. Uh, the offer was made that you know because he moved to Melbourne that I could come to Melbourne with him, and I decided that I wanted to stay in Sydney. Okay. And the DS ended. Okay. Uh, when I was about nineteen. Do you still remain close with him? Yes. Okay, good. He's my first sir. All right. Um, when I won Mr. Queensland Leather, um, he has a lovely place down in Melbourne um, where he has two boys. Um, and he, the boys come through the boys' entrance, not through the front door. 
So when I go and visit, I always go to the boys' entrance. Mm. Now, I'm not a slave. I mean, some of his boys identify as a slave. And I had never come out to him as a pup. I always was a boy. You should never underestimate a serve because they generally know that, you know, there's something different. Mm. Anyway, I... I, he, he, I, I messaged him and said, I won Mr. Queensland Leather, and his response was, I know. I know you have. I'm on Facebook, remember? So, and which is something that wasn't there when we had the DS. Facebook wasn't a thing. Right. Um, he invited me down, and, you know, next thing I had airline tickets in my inbox. Oh, I'm going down to Melbourne. And we travelled, I travelled down to Melbourne, I got picked up from Melbourne by one of the boys. And as I went to walk to the side entrance, like I always do, the boys said, no, no, you need to, no, no, sir, you need to get into your leathers. Oh. And you need to go to the front door. Which was really, it was humbling, but really took me, by, took me back, like, no, I always go to the boys' entrance. This is our thing. Um, so it was humbling and sc scary. To say, you know, I was like, oh well, what do I do, you know. So I got dressed in my formals. Um, I had not seen Sir in his formals for a very long time. So most of the time when, we, when I visited, he was in his suit and tie um, and at work and I would meet for coffee. But and maybe go back to the house and have dinner. And then I'd go on another flight to do something else. So it was always, you know, a fly in, fly out. Hmm. This time I was staying for two days. Because... I had not yet posted that I was Mr. Queensland Leather because I was not able to cope with the fact this was happening. I went very quiet. We scared our current committee who posted on my behalf because I went definitely, definitely silent. Hmm. Um, we then had a chat and I came in, I uh, put my four leathers on, put the sash on and went to the front door and he answered the door. Which is unusual because the boys normally answer the door too. He answered the door in his four leathers, which is always when you, you know, quite magnificent when you see someone in their four leathers, especially someone who's a dominant. Um, and I walked up to it was always common practice to make him his drink. You know, as we went to the library. So we went to the library and no 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 no. I'll make you a drink. Which just confronted me completely because it was almost like upside down, reverse. This is not what's supposed to happen. Um, and he made me my drink and handed it to me. He said, You're my. F while you are not. We're not your DS. You are the first who has ever been titled. Oh, okay. In my family. Oh. Who I consider my family. <coughs> None of my boys have ever entered competition. None of my boys have ever entered the political scene. You are the black sheep. That's what he said. Okay. I always was the black sheep. I mm -hmm. always was the brat. The naughty one. Um, and we sat down, we had a drink, and then I turned around and said, oh, I should let you know I'm a pup. And he went, no, you're not. And so I was taken back by him. What do you mean, no? You can't say I'm not a puppy. You can't be a pup. A pup is a boy who's green, who's new to the sea. No, sir. No, you're not that type of pup. A puppy. And I, so, and I had my hood, and I said, a puppy. And he looked at me, okay. Well, tell us how you found your paws. This is, an paws. this is an interesting story, and it, it's something the audience does need to know. Yeah, I found my paws. Look, that was, um, that was, um, prior to winning Mr. Queensland Love, mm -hmm. and I found my paws. Um, I was at Akon uh, in Lismore, so I had moved up from Sydney, no sorry, Port Macquarie, I had moved up from Sydney, I hadn't got to Lismore yet, I had got into Port Macquarie, and moved up from Sydney, and I would go down and get my gay fix. Okay. So, go back to Sydney because there wasn't a gay fix in Port Macquarie. Oh. I'm sure there was, and there probably is now, there were there definitely gay people in Port Macquarie, lovely people, but wasn't the gay fix I was after because I like be the same. And I was scary because I also like leather. There wasn't many in Port Macquarie who were participating in the scene. Okay. All that I could find. Glenn Pereira, who was um, the manager of Acon, 
turned around and said, you know, you're very bratty. Mm -hmm. Are you sure you're not a puppy? And I'm like, what? What is this you speak of? And I went straight to, oh, no, I'm not into animals. I'm not into bestiality. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, which is a common misconception because those who are puppies are definitely not into animals. Right. Uh, you become puppy-like. Um, you're more playful. Um, and you certainly look for ways to have fun that a lot of dominants may not enjoy. Or enjoy, but won't admit that they enjoy it because it gives them something to be challenged by. Um, so yes, I found my paws and I was looking online at what puppy play was. Okay. And that was about 2012. And of course, one night, my partner, uh, who I've been together with since 1998, uh, walked in and completely freaked out, you know, and accused me of being to bestiality as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it put a little bit of a rip in our relationship for a little while because he had certainly upset because I was looking at doing this and I wanted to explore this and I felt he was very close to the whole whole thing. So I was then encouraged to travel to Brisbane to Bootco because puppies were becoming on the scene in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. So I went to Bootco in Brisbane and, and found there were puppies in Brisbane and handlers. Anyway, my partner had also decided to do some research on puppy play and bought me my first hood. Oh, okay. But speaking of, you, you told me that each of the hoods has its own personality. Every puppy is different. Okay. So just because how I see puppy play is going to be very different to each individual. All right. So I have different hoods um, and each hood has its own personality. Some puppies may only have one personality with different hoods. Some puppies may only ever have one hood. So every yeah. puppy is very individual, where I am very much, I have a few okay. puppies, okay. Uh, personalities. Um, and as I grew and found my paws, I certainly, that certainly did happen. And, um, you know, I'm known as Pup Scout. Um, okay. That name was first spelled S-C-O-U-T, now spelled S-K-O-U-T. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's changed. Um, and it's changed also by dominance, you know, their influence on me. So I've had three dominance uh, since moving up to Brisbane. Okay. So I've been in three DSs. Okay. You brought one of your hoods here. If you, if you would share this hood, tell, tell us about that. So this is Comet. Comet, okay. This is... Um, not my first hood. Okay. This is my second hood. Alright. Uh, so Scout is my first and Comet is my second. Okay. Now Comet is uh, a fur, so it's leather, but it's not fur, like you have a look. Okay. I, I, mean, I hope the cameras can, can get a good look at this. It's very elaborate. And this is the, the, the the prototype that um, Wayne at uh, the creature of Dessart did before he sold them. So we worked backwards and forwards in 2013 with how I wanted, using his design of the scout, my scout hood, which is his black one, how I wanted the fur. And it's interesting because when I said, I want a fur hood, the thing I got was, I don't think I can do that. And yes, he came back with, hold on, I found a nice fur and this is where Comet came from. And the reason it's called Comet is because uh, it's just like a comet in the sky. Okay. Imagine this big bright ball of ice comes travelling down towards us and as it comes in, it wreaks a whole lot of havoc and then disappears into the night. Okay. And that's what Comet does. So you always know when Comet's about because you will come in and there'll be cameras knocked over, Christmas trees knocked over and then he's gone. How do people know the different name for your different hoods. Different personalities. So if I put this hood on, Comet will come out. Okay. If I put Scout on, you'll get Scout. 
But for example, if, if you were to meet a stranger at a bar? You, that would be Scouts. Okay. So the first pub that would meet would be Scouts. Do you say, call me Scout? Or, yes. Uh, okay, okay. So yeah. you actually work with them on that? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, um, the first pub that would meet Scout uh, is the, the lead, I guess, the lead pub. Got it. Um, and there's Spanky. So Spanky's a naughty one, more playful, uh, and will, and is more sexual. So Scout's very sexual, sorry, Spanky's very sexual. Scout will do both, Comet is non-sexual. Okay, okay. So Thomas, Comet is very headspace. Okay. And getting to the pup headspace, and there's... But you, you told me when we were preparing for this chat that puppy headspace uses a different time continuum than other headspaces. What, what does that mean? How long is the history? Um... Okay. So, once again, I mean, I've come up with a theory, and this is my theory, what I feel um, is a way of describing a continuum. Um, if you look at people who, don't, who, who are slaves, or people who are boys, and uh, the, the gamma ray, there's a whole gamma ray, and they go into a headspace, and that headspace is not going to be the same, but we can, we can almost look, there are similar traits. They all have similar traits. Um, I would even say dominance and handlers, and daddies and mummies also have their own headspaces on the other end of the of the gamma type of thing. Um, so what I believe is, um, I have a boy, so I'm a boy as well. So if I'm going to boy space, it's very different to puppy space. Yeah, it's more yes sir, no sir type of thing. When when it's puppy, it's like there's less verbalization. It's arrows. Mm. and howls and, and it's, it's not verbalised okay where boy is verbalised boy does not howl okay. boy does not where a puppy does now um, people I mean this is the argument you're going to have people may agree people may disagree and that's why we are community because that's you know if we all agree to everything we'd be quite boring uh, but I believe that there are different levels of any any form of headspace they you have the sub or dumb, but the headspace where you start, you start losing reality. Um, so with a slave boy or something like that, servitude, you start going down that road. Uh, and what's expected, protocols, um, what the DS contract is. And you have that type of thing. With, with puppy, and because I can switch between the two depending on what needs to happen, I will go to, say, a fourth level where I can still transact between the two, but it becomes quite blurry. So with puppy, um, you start losing the human element. So the human element is, hey, I have a dental appointment tomorrow, so I really shouldn't be being tied up because I'm a bit, you know, a bit funny about it. Um, puppy does not remember the dental appointment. But puppy doesn't care about the dental appointment tomorrow. Puppy does not care about work tomorrow. Because puppy has basically about the, the here and now. Oh, look, there's a ball. Oh, look, there's a squeaky toy. I'm not thinking anymore about the consequence of what I want because it's about the here and now where with boy space, for example, you know, or, or when if I'm being more bratty, I know if I talk back there's a consequence. You know, I'm doing that for a consequence, I'm doing that for or a reward. With puppy it's not like that, it's not thinking through, it's, it's not a planned thing. How did you learn this puppy headspace. Did you work with a handler? The, how did this indigenously come to you? I, I, I don't understand how you knew how to go into these subspaces and, and assume these, these puppy identities. So, I guess it's mimicking. I, you know, I know how bio dogs work. Uh, so I, I've trained bio dogs also. So understanding how they work, like, and then mimicking that behaviour. With puppy, I mean, with boy, and, and, and I guess because I already had done DS stuff, um, with, uh, I had that understanding of protocol and, and, and subspace. And so I kind of, um, went, kind of went, well, I'm going to extrapolate that, learn behaviour, to, well, what does puppy do? So puppies are more playful, more fun, they're a lot more, you know, and, but then you realise that 
you're not thinking like a human. You've got to think like a canine. Is there mentorship in the puppy, puppy community? There is now, yes. When I was first starting out, there was very little. There were okay. definitely okay. people, like there was Pup Riot in Queensland and Pierre Brandt, who certainly were very good excellent mentors, uh, and they shared their experience. Uh, but Pup Riot certainly was one of the very few that were in Brisbane, and we've exploded since then, uh, to a whole community. Um, you know, even to the point where he, he talks about headspace and how to find your paws and, you know, it's about, it's about that now. And, you know, you've got to lose your human element. You're still human, you're mm -hmm. still a human puppy, mm -hmm. you never lose the human. So when people go, oh, but I'm a puppy, don't want to hear it, you're still human. You still have responsibility for your actions. But you're becoming less human. You're becoming more, more puppy, more canine, and as you go further and deeper and deeper, and it's almost like it's almost um, like when you do um, like those gym things you go to, like not Pilates, those other ones. I hate them. I think they're a waste of time. Yoga. Yeah, yoga. Uh, you know, meditation. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. That yeah. type of stuff. It's almost like that. You go into a really relaxed state. And I believe the same with subspace. You, you know, you go into this, this state of mind. If you're going to be flogged or caned in subspace, you know, that's part of what my boy does, um, you go into a different state of mind because normally if someone's hitting you, you're going to fight back because you have that, that element of fight or... Fight or flight. Yeah, yeah. fight or thing happen. When you're consenting and submitting to someone, you no longer have that that type of fight, because you've trusted, you've done, given this trust, and this is the same thing when you're being a puppy, whether you have an alpha or a handler, you are given this trust that you will protect me. And for that return, you'll get the enjoyment of, how, of what, what puppy does for you. Um, so alpha puppies have this, we will have beta and omegas, they get that element of enjoyment, what that puppy does, but they have that trust. So all these relationships and the dynamics are built on trust. And that's the key to a, I feel, a successful um, BDSM relationship is having this element of trust um, and respect uh, for both parties. So it's not just one way street, it's both parties. Um, so when with, with puppy, for example, when I go into the puppy headspace, I'll go really, really deep. And you start losing, you know, I'm not able to drive for an hour or two after because I'm not capable. If I get flogged, I shouldn't be behind a car, a driving wheel, because you're almost drunk mm -hmm. because of all the endorphins mm -hmm. that's going yes. through your head. You yes. shouldn't be driving. Same thing when you're in a puppy, when you're coming out of that space, you shouldn't be operating machinery. It's that simple because it's got the same principles behind what's happening in a normal BDSM type of scene. Now, when you're in your, your puppy space, whichever it is, do you have a master? Or do you have someone that basically is the puppy owner? No. So you're just a free-range pup out there. I have a sir who certainly takes on the handler role, but it's more... Um, and I mean, there is certainly a puppy handler dynamic in that, generally speaking, I guess, because of my position within the community, has certainly became that I don't really have a handler. I'm really self-handled. Hmm. Um, I generally find that when I do puppy now, it's not in public. It's now in closed doors. It's oh, not as public. Okay. I mean, it's now, I don't get into the headspace like I used to. Um, the, and a lot of the reasons are, when I have started getting to the headspace at the Queensland Puppet Handlers, Mosh, as the president, I was then to have someone whisper saying, oh, we need you to do something. And you've got to snap out of it. Mm -hmm. And I find mm -hmm. that snapping out is really bad for the headspace. So you really, in public, you suddenly learn that, oh, I can't bring Puppy out. Mm -hmm. I've got to, you've got mm -hmm. to be, so if I have, this is why I have these levels, I get to that level and I won't go any further with it. So there's still that, is there still more human there than, than puppy? So 
you won't get the same interaction. But in a private, behind closed doors, when puppy comes out, puppy comes out. What personal satisfaction does that afford you? Puppy coming out? Or yeah. not coming out? Both. The, it's, it's, it's a, it's a catch-22. It really is. It's, um, if you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, almost. Um, I need to have my puppy come out. But as I am, have been elected as president of the club, I need to also make sure that others have that, a great and safe time uh, with the, our wonderful committee. We have an amazing committee and a, and a, and a fantastic community. That's just amazing across, you know, Australia. Um, and here in Queensland, just really amazing, very friendly, very caring uh, puppy community um, who look after each other. But when you're in the, when you're running an event or, or in that thing, it's really hard to get into that, to have puppy come out. But when you do, yeah. you, went, you, you say you do it privately, when you do, and you go into that very deep puppy space, what personal satisfaction does that afford you? I don't have to think about the world. I don't have to think about tomorrow. I don't okay. have to worry about, you know, am I going to be able to pay my phone bill? Oh, okay. You know, it's very relaxing, it's very soothing. I don't have to worry. I've been looked after, I've been cared for, and I get to have fun. Oh. And there will always be those bills tomorrow, but in that time, in that right here and now, they don't exist. Okay. I'm no longer human. I'm now a human puppy. And as a human puppy, I can't open a fridge door. Well, I have learned to with my paws. Um, <laughs> but you've got to be fed. You've got to be watered. You know, and if it's, if it's Spanky who's out, there's going to be some form of sexual activity. If it's Comet who's coming out, it's going to be more about playing with the ball and, and you know, doing puppy things. It may be rolling on your back. It may be sitting. It may be staying and doing, you know, what puppies do. Or it may be just laying in your service and lap and getting scriptures and just having that nice connection and that time together, which is just really important. What advice have you for people new to the puppy community? Be you. Be who you want to be. Don't let anyone tell you what puppy is. That's the same in any, any BDSM uh, or leather community. Don't, you know, if you want to conform with what people say the norm is, that's your choice. But we are a community and if we all looked exactly the same, we'd be robots. So. Explore your puppy safely, explore your community. You may not be a puppy, you may be on the handler. So you may be one or the other, uh, or you may be both. And you want to be able to be you, and just don't rush. Don't rush out and buy your first hood. Because in a year's time, your personality is going to be so different uh -huh. that you may not want black, you may want pink. Uh -huh. So, and there's so many more options. When I first came out, there was one hood that fits all. I actually have that hood here. There was one hood that fits all. And that was it. That's the only hood you could buy when I first was finding my paws. And then the Wayne had one that he had, had, didn't sell very well and he, he noticed puppies were coming out of him, so he brought it back out and they started selling. But they weren't, it, it wasn't just on the market like it was. Mm -hmm. And now hoods are in such a variety of colour and design and makes of different materials, you've got neoprene, rubber, leather, yeah, yeah. and they're everywhere. Is there such a thing as, as earning your hood? No. Okay. Unlike leather, some of the leather traditions, and you know, this is going to open up a can of worms, because so many people believe one thing and so many people believe the other. Um, Within the leather community, there are certain people that subscribe to earning leather. Right. And I believe uh, in tr some traditions, not all of them, but some traditions certainly, you know, there are, are times that, you know, leather should be earned. For example, I don't wear a mule cap. I refuse to wear a mule cap. My traditions, what I believe in the values, is it must be earned. It must be presented by community. Okay. Or you must have a house, and your house sees you as a master or so. Um... Otherwise, I don't feel you should just go and buy what it was pretty. Um, puppyhoods are different because it makes your personality, if you choose to. 
There are puppies who don't bite woods because their puppy is a different way, because you don't need to have gear, and this is really important, you don't need to have gear to be a puppy. And you don't need to have, you know, a wardrobe of leather to be a leather person. All right. And this is really important that, you know, we can't lose sight. It's, it's about what's here. Exactly. It's about our heart. Yeah. And that's what I mean with the puppy, you know, go and find what your paws and then go look for the hood. If you want to buy a hood, but don't be precious. Just because everyone else is wearing a hood, and just because Pup Scout has 27 hoods, doesn't mean you have to have a hood. What's the biggest misconception about you? There's probably lots of misconceptions around me. Um, some people would say I'm very soft inside, with a hard exterior. I like to portray that I'm very hard. Um, I'm probably, I am very soft. I am very, I find that, you know, the community is everything to me. And um, when I can find ways to be able to help, I will. And I do not like getting credit for it. I will find other ways that other people get the credit, not myself. I'll hide behind positions. Oh, that's the treasurer. The treasurer's just going to pay the bills. That's the president's role. I just vote. Um, people don't need to know that when assistance comes that, you know, I may stamp my foot or, you know, put an argument up saying this is what something needs. Um, and a good example was a member had his medical equipment stolen from Buco. Not from Buco himself, but Buco. I went to the committee and asked Buco to, you know, can we grant because this person is on a pension and can't afford, and we were able to replace his equipment for him. Oh. Um, if if <laughs> another member didn't contact me and said, oh, you know, have you seen this post? In fact, I would never have known, and we may never have realised. And he was just lucky that the club was in the position to be able to, you know, hey, it's not that expensive and we can afford to help, because without his equipment, this person would die. And unfortunately, with our current government structures in Australia, he already has his equipment replaced. If you lose it, you better replace it yourself. Or wait two years. Wow. And it was stolen. There was a police report. Yeah. So, and this is where um, my first sir says, you get into the politics. But you get into the politics to make a difference. Yeah. He said some people don't. Um, and I think that's really important. You know, the misconception is that you know, I'm not always as hard as I may, may like to pretend that I am. Pup Scout, thank you. Thank you for the fantastic interview here in Brisbane, Australia. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.